Come thou fount of every blessing, tonight art to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mouth of thy redeeming love. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Feel it for thy courts above. We will glorify the King of kings. We will glorify the... We will glorify the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness. We will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. Who we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is the great I am. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all but there's something about that name. Let's sing that chorus one more time. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. away, but there's something about that name. Amen. There's something about that name. That's my favorite name. This is one of my favorite songs. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for Jesus, for his name, Lord, for sending him to die on the cross so that we could have salvation spend an eternity with you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, this morning for the opportunity to worship here, to be among God's people. And Lord God, we just pray that what we do here would bring honor and glory to you. Pray, Lord, you'd be the with the choir as 
we sing here in a minute, Lord, I pray that it would uh, draw hearts closer to you. Lord, I pray that you'd be with the pastor this morning as he preaches. Lord, uh, give him power in the pulpit. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to each one of our hearts this morning. Draw us closer to you. And Lord, uh, for everything that's done here, Lord, I pray that it would bring honor and glory to you. For it's in Jesus' precious and holy name that we ask these things. Amen. Memorial Day weekend. This is a busy time. Uh, folks are getting away a little bit, enjoying some respite and some downtime. But most of all, would you please not forget, this isn't just about barbecues and beach, but this is about remembering this weekend set aside. Uh, those that have given us our freedom, uh, two people to thank for our freedom, God's grace and our military. And so as we enjoy Memorial Day, don't just enjoy uh, the fun part of it, but take a moment to teach your children the reason we have our freedom is because many gave their life and God's grace on America and then also the men and women that paid uh, that great sacrifice and always today uh, brings to mind my, my grandfather, my father, uh, excuse me, my mother's father was killed in the battle for New Georgia Island in the Solomons when my mother was two years old. My mother never knew her father. He was overseas as she uh, grew up there and then got the word that my grandfather, Private Robert Cannon, was killed. And, uh, you know, it is a joy and a great honor that I've got family that paid that price. And many of you do as well. You say, Preacher, we don't. Then you thank God for the men and women in this service. We've got folks here that just uh, tremendous stories. Harmon Carroll and Bill Hastings and many, many of these men, uh, incredible testimonies of service to our country. And so uh, make sure you do that, all right, this weekend. 
teach your children. We're, we're losing that in this country. We're, we're forgetting why we're free. And uh, it's not the politician. It's not the government. It's those men and women that paid the price. So uh, we've got to teach because others are abdicating their responsibility to do so. Uh, but enjoy your weekend. Enjoy your day off tomorrow. But listen, use it as a time to teach. And it's not just about John Wayne movies on TMC. Amen. But uh, anyway, uh, yesterday was a great day. If you were here, we had our wedding yesterday. Uh, the Hunky Dory wedding went off without a hitch. And uh, Brother Dory and Miss Irene, uh, watching them kiss, was like two chickens trying to find a piece of corn together. They just kind of pecking away there. But uh, Brother Dory, Brother Dory, Miss Irene, it was a beautiful wedding. And uh, she was a striking bride. And uh, so we had the big event, and, and we were over there in the fellowship hall, and everybody was uh, taking pictures. And boy, Brother Dory was getting tired. And I said, well, Brother Dory, what are you going to do this afternoon? He said, I'm going to go home, eat a bowl of soup, take a nap. <laughs> amen, amen. But uh, we praise a great, great, great ceremony. We appreciate the privilege to have a part of that. And then also Wednesday, we had a sweet homegoing service for Eileen Harrison. So you keep praying for that family. We're glad you're here. If you're a first-time visitor or a guest, maybe the first time in a very long time at Community, we certainly want to thank you for being here. Would you slip your hand up and let one of these good-looking ushers or whoever comes by your aisle give you a welcome packet and uh, we just want to thank you for being here uh good to see uh brandon's wife brooke here today god bless you and uh, wendy is here somewhere with johan good to have him there she is and uh, wendy and johan are here and then the girls the uh the Sabado girls are home from pensacola avery and amelia and they're home for just a week before they have to go back and pay their school bill and keep working for the summer let's do this let's all stand together choir did great this morning wonderful job we're gonna let them come down and find their seat you find somebody you haven't said hello to yet this morning. Smile real big, Rich. and uh, sing that with me, that chorus. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise His name. He is the Lord, forever His truth shall reign. 
heaven and earth rejoice in his holy name he is exalted the king is exalted on high he is exalted the king is exalted on high i will praise him he is exalted forever exalted and i will praise his name he is the lord forever his truth shall reign heaven and earth rejoice in his holy name he is exalted the king is exalted on high he is exalted the king is exalted on high In Christ alone my hope is found He is my light, my strength, my song His cornerstone is solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are stilled, when striving cease my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, my hope is found. Sing the first verse again. My strength, my song, the cornerstone, this solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are stilled, when striving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand Amen Technology, don't you love it? So, amen. Thank you. That's good singing this morning. You may be seated. It's good when it works. When it doesn't work, you just go watermelon, watermelon, watermelon. Amen. Brother, Brother Daryl, appreciate him filling in at the last minute. Brother Keith, uh, just last minute, took off for the north. Uh, his family had opportunity for him to come up. And so uh, he did a great job. So I want to appreciate Brother Daryl, appreciate Brother Mark, and all of our musicians. We appreciate uh, the work they do. Take your Bible, the book of Colossians, please. Colossians chapter number 1. We introduced last week uh, four or five principles of the rooted man. He's rooted in hope. Aren't you glad you have hope past this life? Uh, did a funeral, of course, Wednesday with Miss, Miss uh, Eileen. And just thinking about uh, if we had hope only in this life. We're of all men most miserable, but thank God we have hope past this moment, past the box. It's always weird. You think it's weird to preach just regular. Uh, you preach when there's a box in front of you with the body of a loved one. And I thank the Lord that I can tell people this is not the end. This is simply the transition. And uh, I'll see you again is something the believer can say to a loved one. But the believer's hope, the way that happens is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's proof of that. You're new creatures in Christ after you become a Christian. And then, of course, we looked there at verse number 6, and we said uh, there's something that's different about you, and there's something that, that people look at you and say, you know, you're not the same guy you used to be. And I appreciate it so much. I love doing the class that I teach, uh, basically new Christians, new uh, to the church, and a lot of folks just come and looking for answers. And it's so neat to watch as, as they're not changing, the Lord is changing them. And uh, just little bit by little bit, here a little, there a little, and uh, just an awesome thing. But this morning, I want to introduce you to a man that's given three references in the Word of God. Here in Colossians chapter 1, later in Colossians chapter 4, and in the very small book of Philemon, he's mentioned again. And in those three different references to this man... There are three different principles shown about this man. 
You know, you can introduce somebody a lot of ways. For example, if I were going to introduce Alan Courtright. Uh, Alan, would you stand for the church, please? I'd like to introduce you, Alan Courtright. Uh, Alan Courtright is my friend. Now, I've introduced him so that you would know something about him. So how many of you know something about Mr. Courtright? He's my friend. You may be seated. Thank you. I, I would like to introduce you, Alan Courtright. Alan, would you stand, please? Alan Courtright, uh, this is the husband to Sarah. The husband to Sarah. What do you know about Brother Courtright so far? He's my friend. And he's the husband to Sarah. Thank you. You may be seated, Brother Courtright. Appreciate that. So I've introduced you to Mr. Corbett. He's my friend. And he's Sarah's husband. Mr. Corbett, would you stand, please? <laughs> this is Mr. Courtright. This is Alan Courtright. Uh, he is from California, and he teaches in our Christian school. He's from California, and he teaches in our Christian school. Thank you, Mr. Corbett. You may be seated. So you know what about Mr. Corbett? He's my friend. He's married to Sarah. He's from California. And he teaches in our Ms. Corwright, would you say it one more time, please? <laughs> Last time, I, I promise. Ms. Corwright is not only my friend, married to Sarah from California, teaches in our Christian school, but he also is the director of RU, Chapter 703, or our Reformers Unanimous Director here at our church. On Thursday night, he leads that ministry. So, Ms. Corwright, I appreciate I'd like to introduce you to my friends, Ms. Corwright. Everybody give Ms. Corwright a good hand for being such a nice... So you know, you know Mr. Courtright is my friend. He's married to? Sarah. He's from the state of? California. He teaches in our? School. And he directs our? Are you? Are you Reformers Unanimous, 703, whatever you say. You know a lot about somebody by how they're introduced to you. You, you, don't, you. you don't know Mr. Courtright at all personally, many of you, and yet you know that he's pastor's friend, you, you know that he's married to a lady named Sarah. You know he's from California. You know that he teaches in the Christian school and he directs the RU. In, in one introduction, five times, I know that's five introductions, but just by introduction, you know a good bit about him. Now, because of the introduction, there's some inferences you can make. For example, if I allow him to teach in my Christian school, you would probably almost 100% guarantee that he's a Christian. Pastor Stancil would not let an unbeliever teach Christianity in a Christian school. So, so by inference, if I say he's a Christian school teacher, he'd probably be a... He's from California. Now, never mind, I'm not going to say a word. That was, that was just throw out there. I'm sorry. That's a lot of stuff. <clears throat> I was preaching a, a wedding in California one time, and I said, yeah, I'm out here in California, the land of fruit and nut, and they didn't think that was funny at all. I mean, not at all. That, that joke just died right on the table there. Anyway. So, so if you know that he's an RU director, you would probably think that he wants to help people. You see how that by an introduction... While you may not know much by way of introduction, you could take that introduction and you could say, well, probably because of this, there's that. Now, this man that I want you to look at, look at with me in verse number 7, please. The Word of God says in Colossians chapter 1, verse number 7, As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Take your Bible and look at Colossians chapter 4, please. Colossians chapter 4. And look down at verse number 12. Colossians 4. And look down at verse number 12. The Bible says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you always laboring fervently, for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in the will of God. Now I want you to look at one other place, if you would, please. Take your Bible to the little small book of Philemon. The little small book of Philemon. Philemon. 
And look at verse number 23. Philemon, if you use an old school for Bible, it's page 1,287, right before we come to Hebrews. Just, just one page tucked right in your Bible. There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Father, I pray as we introduce Epaphras this morning that you'd allow me to be a blessing, a real help. And may we learn some principles, some precepts, some truths from this good man of God. We pray it, we ask it, that you would do great things for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You listen as the family sings. When I see your glory waving in the schoolyard, when children laugh and play learn what's right I remember those who fought to forge our freedom and those who'd rather die than lose their right but today it seems we take it all for granted and it's easier to blame and criticize but I, for one, will stand and say, we're healing in our land today. I still believe that freedom's worth the price. I still believe we're the last hope of liberty. I still believe in the promise of the land I love. And I am not ashamed to say, I pledge allegiance still today. I still believe in America. When I think about the future of this nation, I wonder if the torch will still burn bright. And if each new generation will remember and defend her honor then with all their might. For I believe that the faith of our fathers is the cornerstone that made our nation great. And we will stand for centuries if we remain upon our knees. I still believe thy faith is not too late. I still believe we're the last hope of liberty. I still believe in the promise of the land I love. And I am not ashamed to say, I pledge allegiance still today. I still believe in America. America, America, God shed his grace on thee. shining sea and I am not ashamed to say I pledge allegiance still today I still believe in America I still believe in America Thank you. That's the uh, Hall slash Allen families. And if we could get Brother David to come up next time, we would call him the Von Trapp family singers. What a blessing. Look with me now. Just uh, three different introductions to the man Epaphras. You say, Brother Sansel, not a lot about him in the Bible. Nope, I just read all three places where his name is mentioned. 
three times. And really not a great deal of information in the three introductions. But I'd like to piece together a puzzle about a very good man. A good Christian man. And I want to do that by taking the three introductions that I read to you and showing you some truth about the man. Look at verse number 7. As you've also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful, now look at this next phrase, minister of Christ. A minister of Christ. So introduction number one, Epaphras was a minister of Christ. Now, what does that tell you about him? Well, as you look at the context of Colossians chapter 1, it's the introduction and the Apostle Paul writing to the church of Colossae. And he's just giving them some things. And then he says, and I want to talk to you a moment about Epaphras. Excuse me. And he says, our dear fellow servant. So the first thing that we know about Epaphras was he was serving with the Apostle Paul. Now, I think two things. One, I think he was serving with the Apostle Paul, but I also think he was serving the Apostle Paul. I think he was helping him. Many times in the Scripture you'll find that Paul had men with him that were helping him. They were co-laborers. He uses the term here, fellow servants. Uh, The job of the Apostle Paul was to establish churches and then teach churches and teach people the Word of God. To win them to Christ and then establish them in the faith. And what we learned from Epaphras was this. While Paul was the headline, the work couldn't be done without those alongside of him. And he said, the work that we're doing here, church, it is not just the Apostle Paul. It is men like Epaphras. Now let me say this, and I I have great joy in my heart when I say things like this. I learned a long time ago, Community Bible Baptist Church or Valverde Baptist Church, the two churches that I've had the privilege to pastor, they do not get run. Nothing gets done for the honor and glory of God without fellow servants, men and women that come. You say, well, Brother Sansel, you're the pastor. Yay. I'm the one that you see on Sunday uh, on the track. It's my picture. Uh, uh, When they come to do an interview or talk to me about something, we want to see the pastor. And I get all that. And there has to be a pastor. There has to be a leader. But let me explain something to you. I learned a long time ago, it is those behind the scenes, it is those doing the work of the ministry that don't get to stand up here. There's hundreds of you out here. There's only one here. Let me explain. The greatest work of our ministry is not done by one. It's done by the multitude. Multitudes. Let me just brag on our church for a few minutes. I'm still basking in, glowing in, whatever term you, I'm, I'm having a time. But on Wednesday night, I, I speak to 120, 130 people over in the cube, which is great. That's our Bible study night. But on Wednesday night, there's literally several hundred children in this room, and, and there's hundred plus by the time you combine the rest of it up in the rest of the, uh, the other parts of the building. And uh, we have our 226 ministry in here. And brother, uh, uh, brother, uh, what's his name? Choir guy. Mark, brother Mark, uh, he's in here, and uh, brother Tyler's in here, and all of the workers are in here, and boys and girls are hearing the word of God. And uh, you say, brother Sansa, what do you have to do with that? Let me tell you what I have to do with it. Nothing. Zero, squat, nada. I don't plan anything. I don't run anything. Every now and then I'll walk in and say, hey, and you know what those kids say? Who's that? <laughs> they don't know who I am, but boy, they know who John Holtzclaw is, and they know who Miss Pam is, and they know who all those workers are. So, Brother Sansel, what's the work of the ministry? The work of the ministry is fellow service, not just the Pauls, not just the Timothys, not just the Tituses. It's these Epaphrases. You say, Brother Sansel, who am I? I am nobody but an Epaphras, a fellow servant. So Wednesday night, we had our kids in here. We had Master Club kids upstairs. We had uh, the teenagers in another part of the building. And uh, down on this part of the building, over on the other side, we had Teen Titans. Now, Teen Titans are what we call our bus teenagers. Those are kids that ride our bus predominantly, not not all, but predominantly, their mom and dad don't go to church anywhere. Predominantly, not all, predominantly, there's very little religion in the home, very little Bible in the home, very little God. And predominantly, again, not in all cases, but many of these homes 
are some of the most dysfunctional homes you'll ever find. But Wednesday night, 47 bus teenagers and workers gathered in Barnard Hall. And Brother Ralph had a big push and a big activity and, and got 47 workers and teens in there and gave the gospel. And eight of those teenagers came to trust Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, that's the work of an empowerment. Say, Brother Stansel, that's something you ought to say amen about. Amen. Uh, Brother Stansel, what did you have to do with that? I didn't even know what was going on until it was already upon us. The Epaphrases, the servants that come alongside. And yeah, Paul did the writing and Paul gets the testimony because he, somebody's got to be the voice. But it's the Epaphrases that come along and say, hey, what can I do to get the job done? So I know this about Epaphras. He was a servant right alongside Paul. Number two, I know this. He says in verse number seven, not only was a servant, but he is also faithful. Faithful. You know what the Bible says about putting confidence in an unfaithful man? It's like having a toothache. You know what I say to that? Amen. Putting confidence in an unfaithful man. What does that mean, putting confidence? Uh, I'll use Chad because he's close. Uh, Chad, I, I need you to do this for me. Yes, sir, Pastor, I got it done. Okay, no problem. I'm not going to worry about it because I've given it to a man to get the job done. And then I come back the next day, and this was a critical thing. It had to be done. It was time sensitive. If we didn't get it done right then, we were going to lose the opportunity. Hey, Chad, did, did you take care of that thing I gave you to do? Oh, I'm sorry, Pastor. I got busy. I got, I got sidetracked. I got distracted. I'm going to do it tomorrow. Chad, time's passed. The oh, that's, oh, that's like a toothache. When you have an opportunity that demands attention, and if it doesn't get done, if the job doesn't get completed, you're like, oh, it's, it's like a, there's, oh, abscess, root canal. Can I get a witness? <laughs> Not pleasant. Not something where you wake up and say, whoa, I get to go to the dentist today and have all my teeth pulled out. What a joy. An unfaithful man is like a tooth. It's also like a foot out of joint. You ever break something? Y'all are, are looking. Every time y'all go to shake my hand, y'all and I pull my hand back. Why? Because once you break a hand, break fingers, man, it hurts. And then you come up and grab it and squeeze it and try to show me how tough you are. Listen, I know how tough you are. Shake my left hand, please. Every time you squeeze it, it reminds you, oh, you broke that. And the weather changes and my hand hurts or I use it too much and my hand hurts. It's a constant reminder of a painful thing. Listen, an unfaithful man does nothing for you but bring pain and remind you of hurt and remind you of things that didn't get accomplished because you say, oh, we could have done this and we could have done that and we could have expanded here and we could have reached this group. If only we had someone that would take the responsibility. The Bible says it's required of stewards that a man be found faithful. The only attribute God is looking for is faithfulness. I learned a long time ago, don't hire talent, hire heart. Don't hire talent. Bring heart in. You can teach some talent, but you can't teach faithfulness. You can't teach character. It, 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 you can teach it. I, I do understand that. You can help people to develop. But listen, just be faithful. Do you know what hurt Paul? Paul? Paul later in his life, he said, hey, Timothy, I need you to come so desperately. I'm lonely. Uh, I, I'm by myself. There's nobody here. Bring the books with you. Bring the parts with you. Bring my coat. But he really wanted to see Timothy. Why? Because he said, Demas has forsaken me. I thought he was right there. I, I thought he was going <clears> to <throat> stay with me. I thought he was going to finish the course. But I turned around, was working over here, and I looked back, and he's gone. And, and I don't have anybody to labor with me. Please, Timothy, do thy best to come quickly. Faithful people are a blessing. And unfaithful people are like a constant toothache. Pain. 
You look up in the choir, where's so and so? Oh, they didn't show it. Overslept. Look in the Sunday school. We gotta we gotta find a teacher for the junior part. Why? Cause the teacher. Oh, we gotta find a bus driver. Oh, we got and listen, thank God for faithfulness. You say, preacher, you pastor some older people. That would be a, a statement. Truth. What you like about what you like about the older people? If they're able, they're gonna be there. Yeah, but their voices aren't as good as they used to be. What good is a good voice if it's not there? Oh, she sings like a bird. She just sings on the Sunday. She's supposed to show up. She's not there the rest of the time. What good is a pretty voice if you never hear it? Oh, he's so talented. What good is talent if you never see it in action? Brother Sanson, what, what do you like about the, the older people? They've learned one thing, be in their place. I'd rather preach to, preach to people than to empty pews. I, you say, Brother Sanson, of that person, they can't do as good a job. doesn't matter. They do the job. Whether someone else can do it better who doesn't do it doesn't help me. Faithfulness. What's God looking for? Talent? No. God gives talent. God's looking for faithfulness. It's not talent. It's what you do with talent that matters to God. Faithfulness. Number three. I, I like this about Mr. Epaphras. As you've also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Look at verse 8. Who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Number three, Epaphras was a messenger of good tidings. He was a messenger of good tidings. The church at Colossae sent Epaphras to the Apostle Paul to tell the Apostle Paul a very important message. And the message was that Epaphras was bringing to Paul was that the Colossi church loved him and was praying for him and was supporting him. I'm thankful for those that bring good tidings. Faithful messengers. Some of your faithful messengers, you're just faithful messengers of doom and gloom and discouragement. Every time you call, it's a problem. Every time you call, it's a criticism. Every time you call. Listen, we don't need more discouragers. The world needs some encouragers. Some folks that say, hey, it's not the end of the world, although it's the end times, and we're coming to the end times. Do you understand that as the darkness grows, the light is stronger, and we need some folks that say, hey, uh, Brother Paul, I just want you to know I love you, and I'm praying for you, and I'm supporting you, and our church back home, they're praying for you, and they're right behind you, and, and Paul, we're not going to quit till this thing's over. We need some faithful messengers. The other day, my wife and I were at home, and uh, just out of the blue, family came by. I won't tell you the name. It's not important, but the family came by and just, just loaded down with food and, and just said, we're just thinking about you, and we cooked a little bit. Now, if that was a little bit, I'd hate to see a lot. And I thank God. Y'all know I struggle with my weight. I have a constant weight problem. I will tell you the good news is I've got the victory over anorexia. But I constantly struggle with my weight. And there's some of you, now not many, thank God, but there's some of you that, that bring me things with salads involved. Now, I like salads. If you put enough cheese and bacon on it, it's all right. <laughs> you cover anything with bacon, and it becomes a, it comes a game of find the bacon. But this family, they didn't bring me salads. There was no, there was no spinach or any other healthy thing. It was hush puppies. Can I get a witness? And it was fish, and it was french fries, and it was dessert. And, and, and they brought that in. And then they brought in a little envelope that said, For your, listen to it, encouragement. And the dear wife said, Whenever you get down, just pull one of these out. It's a note that our family has written. You just need a little encouragement. Just pull. So my wife took that and put it up in our, in our pantry room there. And, and if you need a little encouragement, just go in and pull one out, read it, put it back. And uh, I walk by there because it's in the pantry. I walk by there often. And uh, every time I look at it, thank God for faithful messengers of encouragement. Sometimes the job of the preacher is to reprove, to rebuke, and there's difficulties in trying to encourage and help people. But listen, we all need a little bit of an encourager every now and then. If you think it's your job to keep 
everybody else humble. Why don't you give that to the Holy Spirit and you take the job of being an encourager? If it's your job to keep all the problems corrected in the church, why don't you give that to the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and you take the job of being an encourager? If it's your job to corral and correct all the other Christians, why don't you leave that to the Holy Spirit and the Word of God? And why don't you spend your time being an encourager? Hey, we don't need many people tearing down, but we do need some people building up. Exhort one another. Provoke one another. That means to, to push along, to, to encourage. So much the more as you see the day approaching. It's depressing enough without coming to church with a lot of depressing people. Let's be encouragers. Hey, uh, we love you and are praying for you. And, and, and we think you're going to make it. He was a faithful messenger with a positive message of love. Paul, we love you. We're praying for you. Now, number two, if you look at Colossians 4 quickly, look at the phrase, minister of Christ. Now, look at verse 12, Colossians 4, 12. Epaphras, which was one of you, now look at this phrase, a servant of Christ. A servant of Christ. Now, we've already looked at what a servant is. So, let's look at a few things we learned in verse 12. First of all, as a servant... The Bible says that he's a member of the church at Colossae. Because look at verse number 12. He says, he's one of you. Now Paul's writing to the Colossae church. And he's writing to Epaphras' family. His church family he says, now Epaphras is with me, but he's one of you. So the first thing we learned about Epaphras in this second greeting is he's a member of the local church. Now let me say this. I believe the Bible is very clear in the teaching of the ministry of the local church. Now, we're saved, we're part of the body of Christ. But as a saved member of the body of Christ, God gives us local bodies of believers to do the work of the ministry. And the work of the ministry is to encourage one another, to propagate the gospel, and to glorify God. You say, Brother Sanson, what are you, you preaching on Sunday morning about being a part of the local church? Because many of you, now look at me, I love you all. If you're, however you got here, whatever your reason, how many times you come, I love you. Come as often as you want. But there's a difference between attending and belonging to. An attender can't be counted on. We don't know when you're going to attend or not. We want you to get in and get involved so that you can join us. Labor together with us. Our society has come to the place where we don't want to belong to anything. We don't like commitment. Because with commitment comes responsibility. Now let me make this very clear. If you're part of this church, you have the responsibility of this church. That, that's why those of us that are members here, now, now don't take this wrong but we care what goes on here. We're concerned about each other. We're concerned about the gospel ministry. We're concerned about the work of this place. You know why we're concerned? We support this place physically. We support this place spiritually by our prayers. We support this place by our effort. And we support this place by our finances. And so this place is very important. When my wife and I got married, we were members of the Middle Tennessee Baptist Church. And that was the church that I got ordained and sent out of. And my whole life was what we could do there uh, as a couple at Middle Tennessee. And then we went to Emmanuel Baptist Church. And there for three years, that was our church family. And then for 12 years, Val Verde. And now for four years, community. This is where we belong. You say, you used to be a member there. Yes, I did, but now I'm a member here. And here's, you say, do you love Val Verde? With all my heart. I love those people. I hurt for those people. I, I want to see great things there. But, but this is where God has put me. And this is my local church. And many of you say, well, brother, we used to belong to so-and-so. I don't care where you used to belong. Where do you belong right now? Where are you? you, you said, so we, we, we used to belong there, so, so we support that church. Well, that would be like going to Burger King and paying McDonald's. Wouldn't help too much. It's a member some of you have been attending for months now. You're more faithful than some of my faithful members, but we can't use you because we want you to commit to us. By the way, when you commit to us, we commit to you. 
We, we're we're going to tell you that we're going to do our best to preach the word of God to you and love you and help you and, and try to help your family and help your friends. You say, Brother Sanzo, what do you get when you, when you join the church? Well, it's, you, you say, well, what's the tangible benefits? You get us. Now, that may not thrill you. <laughs> but when you bury your loved ones and when you're hurting and when the wheels come off your car and you're looking for help, and all of a sudden a loving church family throws their arms around you and says, hey, we're going to stand right here with you. And we're going to love you through this. You can attend, but you don't get the benefits of being a part. So number one, he was a member. But number two, I love this. I never saw this before. I saw this yesterday. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you. Now look at this next phrase. Always laboring fervently. Now, what's the next phrase? For you in prayers. Man, Epaphras, what were you doing? You were over there with Paul doing work. What were you doing for Colossae? He was fervently laboring in prayer. He was a prayer warrior. He was praying for the church of Colossae. And then it's interesting, the Word of God tells us exactly what he was praying for the church at Colossae. He said, I'm praying for you that ye might stand perfect and complete in the will of God. The word perfect in your Bible many times is the word spiritually mature. Complete in Christ, lacking nothing. In the will of God, knowing that you're in the center of God's will. What an awesome prayer that you would grow and that you would become what God has for you and that you would live in the center of His will. Let me explain to you something. The best place to be, wherever that place may physically be, the best place for you to be is in the direct center of God's will. And Paul had a friend named Epaphras who was praying, and I'm sure he's praying that for not only the church at Colossians, I'll show you in a moment, he was praying for other churches as well, other believers as well, but he was praying, God, grow them, God, strengthen them, God, show them what you have for them. And that's the prayer that many of us have for each other, is that God would use us in such a way to help you grow in faith and help you grow in maturity and help you to find the perfect center of God's will. You say, Brother Sanson, my life is a mess, it's a failure, I'm miserable, I'm empty, it doesn't matter where you've been it doesn't matter where you are but I'm going to promise and tell you that God has a perfect plan for you he has a desire for you he has a hope for you and our job and the person sitting to your right or the person sitting to your left his prayer or her prayer for you is that you would find the will of God for your life you'd find perfect peace in your life you'd find that completion that you're searching for and you don't have and that's what we're praying that God would give you what you're longing for and the only way to find that is in him labored in prayer many of you have called me or texted me over the years pray for so and so boy they're really searching they're really hurting they're really having a hard time and I, I, I don't know but what in the world you could have a better friend who loved you enough to pray for you that God would do a work in your life some of you may be a husband praying for you, or a wife, or a daughter, or a son, or a mother, or a father, but they've not given up praying that God would do a work in your life. How many of you had a praying family member when you were away from the Lord? Let me see your hand. Listen, those prayers move the heart of God. The Bible said the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. They make a difference. Epaphras, what are you doing for Colossae? Well, I'm praying for brother so-and-so. He's struggling. I'm praying for sister so-and-so. She's going through a hard time. I can't hardly go through a day, and, and neither can you. I don't know many of you, but you think of someone, and you say, oh, they're going through a tough time. Oh, their marriage, their, their kids, or their finances, their job, their, their health. Yesterday, we, we had the wedding here, and the young man that was to my far left, many of you don't know the story there, but, but he's a young man, just a very young man, and, and uh, he moved very slowly. You could tell something was wrong. He's fighting cancer. And his jaw is eat up with cancer. He's, he, I asked him about it yesterday at the reception. It's a very rare form of cancer. Very, very rare. So very few people get it. And it's destroyed his jaw. So what they've done is that with all the treatment and chemotherapy, they went into his leg. They removed a bone. And literally, now I'm, I'm just telling you what they told me. They removed his face. 
reworked his jaw with the bone from his leg, and then placed his face back on his face. I mean, I was like, oh, my. Well, here I am looking at my beautiful wife and our kids. And I'm thinking, God, you're so good to me. How can I not pray for a man about my age? I, I don't even know him. I met him one time. But, but I, every time I think about his, him standing there, right, right there for that wedding, I think, God, help him as, as he's going through what many of us could never imagine. And you say, Pastor, how can I get through this? I don't know how you're going to get through it, but I know this. With prayer of other people, there's a great help on the way. He labored in prayer, number two. And then number three, quickly, and I'll give you this. this uh, little little throw-in phrase here. little throw-in phrase, but look at it. He labored fervently for you in prayer that ye may stand uh, perfect and complete in all the will of God. Now look at verse 13. For I bear him record. Paul says, I'm testifying about this. I'm telling you this is the truth. That he has great zeal for you. And them that are in Laodicea and them that are in Heropolis. Number three, he was a great encourager not only at Colossae, but also at Laodicea and Heropolis. Now, this is my local church. I pastor the greatest church in the world, Community Bible Baptist Church. But every day I think of other church families and other members of church. This morning, our men gathered around, and many of the prayers were for other pastors and other churches, and, and we're bearing the burdens. Listen, I have a zeal for you, but I also want Murray Kimball to do well. So Brother Stanley, who's Murray Kimball? He's a young man that was saved in our church in Texas, and, and he was called to preach in our church in Texas, and, and we helped him get an a, a assistant pastor job in, in Selmer, Tennessee, and then uh, my father-in-law left to take another church, and the church voted him in as pastor. Every day of the week, I say, God, help Murray and grow them, and, and Murray will call me and say, Pastor, what do I do about this? And Pastor, how do I do this? And, and then he'll call me and say, Pastor, we had 50 in Sunday school today. And you and I say, 50? We got classes bigger than 50. 50 for them would be like 500 for us. And man, my zeal for him and Chris Strother pastoring out in California and Ryan Strother, missionary to England and, and Davey Redford up in Virginia and, and Alyssa who's going to have her second baby and, and all these kids that, that we saw grow up and, and the churches that we know and the people. Hey, there's a lot of Christians around the world that need somebody to labor in prayer for them. But you're too busy to pray because, you know, you're the most important person in the world. And your needs are all that matters. You ever thought about this? If you got as burdened for others' needs as you were for yours, maybe God would get his burden for your needs. Well, Lord, I need this and I want this. What if our church got busy praying for other churches? You think God might start pouring out his blessing more on this church because we're faithful to pray for other churches? What if you started praying for their loved ones, and God sends somebody to deal with your loved ones. See, the way to get from God, now listen, this is, this is not a prosperity gospel, but let me give you a very simple biblical principle. You want God's blessing on you, you bless others. You want God to answer your prayer, you pray for others. You want God to bless this church, you help others. You turn the attention. You know why your world is so small and caving in on top of you? Because all you see is your own world. But you start praying for others. Listen, you start praying for missionaries. I get a Voice of the Martyr update every day. Voice of the Martyrs tells me that around the world, Christians are being murdered across the globe for no other reason but their faith. Hey, I'm praying for them. You know why? Because it may come a time when we have to take that test. And we'll be begging God for somebody praying to up for us. Number three, he was a great encourager. Not only to those around him. I, I had uh, one of our men... Tell me this week that he's taken up the habit of emailing our missionaries and talking to them via internet. And he said, Pastor, it helps me to pray for them. As a, as a person married into a missionary family, I promise you this, that is one of the great joys of their ministry, knowing that people back here are praying for them. When's the last time you prayed for a missionary by name? Valerie's got a friend. She's, he's, he's her age. Chris is 41, 42. He's up in Chattanooga, Tennessee right now. And uh, Chattanooga? Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I grew up on the mission field with her in Haiti. Battling right now life or death. Life or death. A terrible infection. And 
blood clotting, aneurysm, you name it, he's had it. And, and this is our friend Connie Anderson's son. Now listen, we're praying for Chris. Could you imagine how you'd be praying if that was your son or your nephew or your grandson? Boy, you'd, you'd be at the altar every day. It is somebody's son. It is somebody's husband. It is somebody's father. It's a great encourager not only to those around him but to others. But I want you to see the last one, Philemon. Quickly, Philemon, verse number 23 this one's interesting about Epaphras. It says, there salute thee, Epaphras. Now, Philemon is the book that was written as an encouraging letter back to Onesimus about a runaway slave named Philemon. And as he closes the book after dealing with the business about Philemon and Onesimus, he says, and by the way, uh, salute Epaphras, my, what's the phrase, fellow. What happened to Epaphras? You go back and you study that at this time in church history, Nero, with all the power of Rome behind him, ramped up the persecution of churches, Christians. And apparently, our friend Epaphras got caught up in one of those sweeps of persecution, and now he's a prisoner, fellow prisoner. So you're supposed to encourage us. You're, you're supposed to tell us that if we live for God and pray for others and do right, that everything's going to turn out great. Uh, no. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's not always going to end up great here. But you have to do one analysis and we'll be done. You have to do an analysis of cost versus reward. Is it worth it? To be that minister of Christ? Is it worth it to be that servant of Christ? Is it worth it to be that prisoner of Christ? Prisoner, excuse me, in Christ. Paul said, as he was getting ready to give his head for the gospel, fought a good fight. He said, I'm done. I know. My, my race, I've, I've finished my race. My race is over. So, henceforth is laid up for me. Paul, what are you going to look at? I'm going to look back at what I could have had on earth, or I'm going to look forward to what I have in heaven. Epaphras, did it turn out well? Well, yeah, I went to jail. We don't have record of what happened to Epaphras. Maybe beheaded, maybe persecuted, maybe we don't know. But I do know this. His name is recorded in God's inerrant eternal word. And just like in Mark chapter 14, where the word of God speaks of the, the woman Mary who brings the box of alabaster ointment and breaks it over Christ and anoints his body for the bearing. And Jesus said, this woman, what she's done, will be spoken of as a memorial for her. As long as the word of God lives, the name of Epaphras will be mentioned as a Minister of Christ, a servant of Christ, and a prisoner in Christ. I guarantee you, Epaphras was glad he did what he did when he had the chance. We buried Eileen on Wednesday, and that's the sermon I preached because a few weeks ago, Paul and I left her bed there at hospice, a 94 and a half year old lady. Taught Sunday school, never had children. Her husband didn't want children, she never had children. And she taught little girls in Sunday school. And, and the ladies that remember those days will tell you that those Sunday school girls became her girls. Then she did Awana. And then she did the Dorcas Missionary Society. And, and just served here in the local church for years. And boy, her family shed some light into her life that we didn't have record of from her younger days in Virginia. And, and uh, just neat to see pictures of a young Eileen. Here's a 94-year-old lady. Uh, boy, back in the day, she was vibrant and at the beach and the water and all. Just amazing. But they testified, the family, so you know, they know the truth. They testified of her love for the Lord. We saw it as a church family. And Eileen made this statement. Paul and I were leaving her bed the, that one day, and she said, uh, I'm glad I did what I did when I had the chance. You know why she said that? She's in hospice. Anybody knows what happens at hospice? 
you, you have one, normally, now every now and then people recover a little bit, but most of the time hospice is the last stop before the next stop. Well, the next stop's eternity. So when you get to hospice, you start weighing things out because you know you're about to give your report card. She said, I'm glad I did what I did when I had the chance. Because she's looking at eternity saying, man, 94 years went by like that. And now I'm about to give an account to the Lord. You might not be the pastor. There's only, there's only one. And that's my job. But every one of us can be the Epaphras. Let me promise you this. I and you both will be very glad we did what we could do when we had the chance. Epaphras, servant, minister, prisoner. Let's just be an Epaphras. Father, I pray you'd help us this morning as we consider our place. or We'll give an account to you for what we've done. Lord, if we're not saved, we'll give an account for our sin. But if we're saved, we'll give an account for our service. Lord, help us to be faithful, ministers, servants, if need be prisoners in Christ. But Lord, may we be that kind of Christian that others look at and say, I'm glad that person is in my life. Boy, they're praying for me. I know they're encouraging me. Their zeal for me is so strong. Boy, I'm glad the Lord allowed so-and-so to come into my life. Heads are my eyes are closed. Nobody looking around, nobody moving around. Just, just let me ask you two questions. We'll be finished. First question is very simple. Are you that Epaphras-type Christian? I mean, serving the Lord, faithfully ministering, locked into a local assembly of believers, praying and encouraging, edifying one another. If not, start. Don't worry about where you've been. Just look forward to where you're going. Be that Epaphras Christian. Second question is this, if you died today, very simple question. Stroke, heart attack, car wreck, doesn't matter how you die, but you died today. Uh, 1208. At 12.15, you're dead. Do you know where you'd go after that? The Bible said it's appointed a man who wants to die, and after this, after death. Oh, there's, there's nothing after death. The Bible says there is, so you're going to place your whole eternity on the fact that you're right and God is wrong. Not a good win for you. After this, the judgment. Only two groups of people in the room. You say, well, there's men and women. Nope. Black and white. Nope. Two groups of people. Jesus divides the world right down the middle. He says in the book of John, chapter 3, verse 36, He that hath the Son hath life. Now, that's not just eternal life. But that's also life on earth. He that hath the Son hath life. That's group one. And he that hath not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So two groups of people, those that know Christ and those that don't. Knowing Christ is not mental assent to the fact there is a God. Satan knows there is a God. The devils know there is a God. But to know him means to trust him, to rely, to depend upon him, to put your faith in him. The Bible says, as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. If you don't know Christ, you have no hope beyond this life. Whether 19 or 94, you'll die and give an account. If you're here this morning, you don't know Christ, the person next to you, the person in front of you, behind you, or I can help you with a Bible, show you how to be saved. If you need to be an Epaphras Christian this morning, make it other decisions. Some of you attenders ought to come and join a good assembly of believers. Let's stand to our feet. Father, I pray for those that need to make decisions, save those that are lost, and help those that are saved. We pray your blessing now on this time. Move amongst us and help us in Christ's name. Amen. Daryl, lead us in a song. Folks are already coming.
Oh, to Jesus I surrender All to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him In His presence daily live I surrender all I surrender all All to Thee, my blessed Savior I surrender all All to Jesus I surrender Humbly at His feet I bow Worldly pleasures all forsaken Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. show you from the Bible. Any question you have, we'll have a Bible answer for you. You got something going on, say, where do I go from here? Let's look at the Bible, see what the Bible says. We'll sing one more verse. If you need to come, join the church, make a decision, whatever that need is. This is time. This is a time to say, God, I'm going to take that first step and from there let God do the rest. You sing, Brother Dale. All to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy Thine. Let me feel Thy Holy Spirit, truly know Thy power divine. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Let me just uh, encourage you, if you have a question, and uh, you, you haven't had it answered yet, you come see me. Uh, Daryl will be here with Dan, with Alan, the folks all around us. And uh, we'll try to help you. Uh, if you're a lady, we have several ladies right here. Miss uh, uh, Nancy's right here and uh, Miss Jane. So if we can help you. Uh, Angel Angelica is coming to join the church this morning. And we rejoice so that she's been coming. Literally, I thought we'd already done this. So uh, I told her the title of the sermon was Epaphroditus or Angelica, which everyone's paying attention. But... Uh, Angel, you've been saved and baptized, and just love this young lady. She's moved here from North Carolina, and already uh, just been a neat part of our church. And so all in favor and rejoice that Angelica joins, say amen. amen. And we praise the Lord for that. And Matt's come this morning to rededicate his life as well. Matt, God bless you, dear friend, and to be praying. Uh, love on Angelica. She's already a great part of what's going on around here, and we appreciate uh, her so much. So just incorporate her uh, into your family. Uh, let's receive our offering and our men are here, ready to go. So this is our time of giving. Uh, if you're a member of Community Bible Baptist Church, if you're a guest, uh, we, we don't have any pressure on you to give at all. In fact, if you're a guest this morning, I have a gift for you. If you'll come meet me at the front, all of our guests, I'll give you a gift. I want to shake your hand. And I'm still recovering from my broken fingers, so shake my left hand, please. That would help me tremendously. Yesterday at the funeral, uh, I had a little old man. And I'm thinking, little old man, he's going to have, you know, uh, apparently, he was a World War II fighter grip champion of the world, and uh, he, he just got me one of those good right hands of fellowship, and I'm like, ah, you know, so uh, just doing great, by the way. I can move them and all that, but uh, just don't shake my hand, all right? But if you're a guest, come meet me. Members, give. It's our summer season. Officially, of course, this weekend, uh, we're right around the corner of Vacation Bible School, our camps and all that, so a lot, a lot going on if you would please be faithful in your giving. Father... Bless the gift, the giver. May we use it wisely here in this place for the furtherance of the gospel of Christ and around the world. 
We ask it and believe in this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you as you give. All right, a couple of quick announcements. First of all, uh, we are having a junior camp meeting. If you're interested in sending your children to junior camp this year, the dates are June, or, sorry, July 8th through the 14th. That's Monday through Friday. Uh, the week right after our Single Vision Conference, we're going to have a meeting in Barnard Hall where you pick up your kids for junior church, uh, from junior church after, after the service. Uh, right over there, we're going to pass out permission slips, uh, information sheets, things like that. Um, also concerning junior camp, we're going to have a dessert auction as we do every year. Uh, coming up here on June 23rd to help raise expenses for our camp, uh, raise money for the expenses for camp as far as fuel and things like that. Um, so uh, if you have any questions about that, come see me or come to the meeting. We're going to talk about it a little bit more than that. Um, be prepared because we always have a good time. We have a lot of really cool desserts that people bring for that. Uh, then also tonight after the service, we're having a vacation Bible school meeting. We're going to meet over in Barnard Hall as well. Uh, it's a little bit sp uh, spacier and a little cooler over there. Uh, we'll be passing out the schedules and the job assignments, things like that over there. Um, also for vacation Bible school, we were looking for one of the, one of the big things we're still looking for is we need someone uh, or a group of people or however uh, to donate something for our snow cone machine. We need to rent a snow cone machine. That's kind of a bigger expense. So if someone's interested in doing that, helping us out with that, uh, just come let me know, see me, and I will uh, we'll get that set up. Um, then also, uh, kind of around this time of year, coming up with all these camps and uh, conferences where we're sending people to it, uh, if someone comes to you and asks you about uh, you know, sponsoring their kid to go to camp or something like that, uh, come to us just for your protection. Make sure that uh, you let us know, and we'll, uh, we'll tell you whether or not it's a, it's a good idea. We'll let them go through us rather than come straight to you. We don't want anybody getting taken advantage of, uh, so just make sure you're wise with that. And if you have any questions, come and see uh, me or one of the other staff members. I'll give you a couple of things. Marty, who played the organ, has some CDs on the back. And if you're interested in that, two CDs, 16 songs each. If you like uh, organ music like that, it's very well done so you can see her. And then also the senior saints are going to the medieval times. This is where you eat and you watch the jousting and all that. Medieval times, uh, or as Brother Warren says, the good old days. So uh, you can... Uh, if you're a Sunday school teacher, your curriculum is in the office. You can get that picked up. And then uh, speaking of prayer for church family, the Krugers are back in Ohio. Freddie is having hip replacement surgery on Wednesday. So Brother Freddie is having the hip replaced. If you could pray, pray for him. And then June the 2nd is Move Up Sunday. So if your kids are moving up to the next grade level, uh, that's June the 2nd. They'll move up there. And then the 3rd 
is uh, going to be our Baptist Fellowship meeting here. We're hosting at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Please come meet preachers from the other area. You have a good preaching. Uh, that two, that, uh, that uh, Sunday night, uh, the second, Brother Bagwell will be with us. And Brother uh, Albright was a member of his church up in Silva, North Carolina. And so Brother Bagwell will be preaching. And then also Brother Yanizzi and then Brother Hawkins, uh, Tim Hawkins will be with us as well. Okay? If you're a guest, come and meet me. I have a gift for you. Any other announcements? Scott, the meeting for sending your daughter to junior camp is right out there. Do not run over any of the little old people trying to get to that meeting, all right? Scott, was, we were talking about junior camp. He said, you mean you send the kids away for a whole week? He thinks he's died and gone to heaven. Let's all stand together. And uh, good to see you guys from South Carolina. Hey, Brother Larry, who sits in the wheelchair right here, rushed to the hospital this week with a major, major blood clotting issue, so pray for him. And then also Alice Johnson's home from the hospital. Keep praying for her. Good to see you guys from South Carolina. I love you. God bless you. You're dismissed. Guests, come meet me.